again, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. This is Todd Roberts from SenseMetrics. We want to welcome everyone to a live webinar we're presenting on the Kamenata Marsh Creation Project. I'm honored to be joined by a group of fellow um, practitioners. Uh, we're joined with Tony Simmons from Geocon, as well as Matt Sullivan. And then on my side, we also have Robert Lee um, here to talk about this project. Um, as we go through, um, Robert will guide us through the slides here. So we'll go to the next slide. little housekeeping here. This is a live webinar, uh, so we'll have the ability to talk to you live and interact with the group here that's presenting. Uh, we'll have the ability to ask questions throughout the presentation and then holding a question and answer session at the end. We will hold the questions to the back end. Uh, we ask that you enter your questions uh, privately or as a group in the panel on the right of your screen, if you see uh, near the bottom of your panel. Um, after the webinar concludes, uh, we will host the question and answer session and then follow up with an email answering all questions that were submitted. Um, sometimes we, depending on the quantity of questions, we might do that in uh, two follow-up emails. We'll also provide a link um, to this webinar which will be recorded so you can share with your colleagues um, that are interested but weren't able to make it. First, we're going to start off with a little bit of bios. Um, I'll start off with myself. Again, I'm Todd Roberts. I work for SenseMetrics in Denver, Colorado. I have 20 years of industry experience, 15 years of which was practicing as a geotechnical engineer and geologist, at which, uh, at which point I built a instrumentation division within the company I was working for that consisted of design and monitoring services in the Rocky Mountain region. The last five years plus of my career has been on the manufacturing side where I currently manage the infrastructure vertical for SenseMetrics. And now I'll ask Tony to give us a little background on himself. Yeah, thanks, Todd. Hello, everyone. So um, I'm one of the directors at Geocon, who most of you know is a manufacturer of geotechnical and structural instrumentation. I graduated from Portsmouth University in the UK in engineering, geology, and geotechnics way back in 1979. and moved to the US in 1981, where I've been working with Geocon now for over 36 years. At Geocon, I'm responsible for overseeing our overseas agents and representatives, and before COVID, traveled extensively to support them in both technical and commercial related matters. Now, like many of you, I suspect I work mostly from home. I'm an active member of several industry related organizations, and I've spoken at numerous courses and conferences around the world, and it's a pleasure to be speaking with you all today. Hello, my name is Robert Lee, and I have been working in the geotechnical and construction industry for 10 years now. I started in consulting for the first seven years where I earned my professional engineering license and gained lots of ex hands-on experience bidding, designing, and installing instrumentation. Then in 2018, I joined SenseMetrics, where I currently manage our infrastructure accounts in the central and western United States. Hi, I'm Matt Sullivan uh, with Geocon. I've got 25 years of experience in the geotechnical instrumentation field, uh, both in uh, consulting for about seven years in the Boston area and Detroit area uh, as a field geologist, and then the last 18 years or so uh, involved with manufacturer instrumentation manufacturer sales uh, in the last 11 here with Geocon. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, so now we're going to start to dive into the webinar, um, but briefly to catch everyone up on what we're going to present, we're going to do some overviews on both Geocon and SenseMetrics, then we'll dive into the actual case study. And Robert will walk us through the background of the project, the challenges that we were faced with, and then the solutions that were delivered to the project. Then we'll climb into some of the technical details by looking at Geocon's technology as well as SenseMetrics technology, and then Robert will share some stories about the the software that's been put together by the end user in the project as well as installation photos and then we'll wrap everything up with a conclusions and benefits section before we tackle addressing questions that are submitted a little bit about sense metrics we operate on five contents um, sense metrics has physical offices in san diego california which is our headquarters in denver colorado where we're continuously developing and maintaining hardware and software solutions. SenseMetrics operates in many industries, ranging from water resources to transportation, 
mining, construction, energy, and even oil and gas. With a strong global network of partners, SenseMetrics provides various monitoring solutions to hundreds of owners, operators, engineers, and consultants, and has hosted nearly 900 million observations to date. So Geocon is located in Lebanon, New Hampshire, and um, like SenseMetrics, we operate out around the world through a network of agencies and representatives. The company was founded in 1979, and presently we have over 120 employees. We also have an office in Singapore, which serves our customers in the Far East, along with four members of staff working from their home offices at st strategic locations across the US. Our products are designed, and all the products are designed and manufactured at the factory in the USA by a staff of qualified engineers, machinists, and assemblers, and so on. I think it's fair to say over the years we've developed a line of, of uh, highly reliable vibrating wire sensors, which have really contributed to the acceptance of vibrating wire as one of the most suitable technologies for geotechnical applications. Now we'll hand uh, this over to Robert, uh, who's been working closely with the client to deliver the solution. Um, so Robert has a great understanding of, of the, the background of the project. And Robert, uh, please walk us through this. Thanks, Doug. The Kaminata Back Barrier Marsh Creation Project is one of many similar projects on the Louisiana coast. So before we dig into the details of this project, I'd like to take a step back and look at the larger issue at hand. Our riverways are crucial transportation corridors that have been instrumental in developing the United States. Our dependence on these rivers demanded reliability, which resulted in building levees to prevent the river from meandering and dredging to allow for larger vessels to pass through. This channelization has effectively cut off the natural deposition of sediment along the coastline and brings them to the edge of the continental shelf. At the same time, tides, storms, and hurricanes are wearing away at the coastline, causing massive amounts of erosion. Over 1,900 square miles of coastline have been lost since the 1930s, and over 4,000 additional square miles are at risk over the next 50 years if no action is taken. After Hurricane Katrina struck in 2005, the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority, or CPRA, uh, was founded to centralize the effort. And they have since completed over $8.5 billion in work, including revitalizing barrier islands, marshes, and swamps, among other initiatives, to reduce the impacts of these storms. Now to focus on coming out of Marsh, this CPRA project began in early 2020 and is still currently in construction. The site is in the Lafouche Parish, about 50 miles directly south of New Orleans. In the near vicinity, it's in the near vicinity of Port Fouchon, uh, just off the left side of this photo, which services 90% of the Gulf of Mexico's deepwater oil production. There's also Louisiana Highway 1 uh, to the north of this project, which is the only road that services the town of Grand Isle to the east of the site. The footprint is the footprint of this project is long and narrow, reaching eight miles in length and approximately 1,000 feet wide. At completion, it will have created and revitalized 900 acres of new marshland and will offset 20 years of erosion. Sigma Consulting Group holds the inspection testing contract, while SNME is subcontracted to provide geotechnical and instrumentation services. The site faces a number of challenges. In addition to being very long and narrow, the site is also remote for the engineers at over three hours by car. Once they get to site, it can be another hour by fan boat just to access the instrument locations. Environmentally, this was an especially difficult year as 2020 was a record year for tropical storms. And on October 28th, Hurricane Zeta passed directly over the project site bringing a storm surge on the order of six feet. All these conditions needed to be accounted for when developing the geotechnical instrumentation monitoring plan. And this in part is what led them to choose the geocon and sense metric solution. 
Now, five to six years prior to this project, a sand dune was, uh, that's kind of shown on the right-hand side of this cross-section, uh, was constructed. And if you saw it today, it would resemble a spit. This current project focuses on infilling behind the dune to maximize the footprint of the headland. The end result, as SNME likes to put it, is creating a speed bump for hurricanes. This ultimately weakens the storm, reduces the impact on inland inf infrastructure, and protects against erosion of the vulnerable marshland. So the first phase of this project is to build the containment dike on the backside. This is performed in three lifts, similar to any other embankment or surcharge. Uh, as the fill is placed, fibering wire piezometers installed in the native soil below the footprint monitor consolidation and stabilization of soils by measuring the pore water pressure. These piezometers are connected to GeoNet nodes, which communicate back to the SenseMetrics thread. When the containment dike is complete, a slurry of seawater and dredged sand from offshore is pumped in between the dike and the dune. As the sand settles out of the slurry, the excess seawater is pumped out. The resulting infill and consolidation of underlying soils is monitored with instrumented settlement plates, which is outfitted with both fibering wire piezometers and pressure cells. The fibering wire pressure cell coupled with the piezometer allows SNME to measure the effective stress of the placed sand and further be able to calculate geotechnical properties of the fill. And with that, I'll now turn over to Tony, who will walk us through the instrumentation scope in a little more detail. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Robert. So as we saw in the previous slide, each of these monitoring sites includes a custom-made settlement plate, along with a pressure cell and, and two or three piezometers, all of which are connected to the GeoNet node mounted onto the top of a two-inch schedule 40 PVC pipe. So these GeoNet nodes are low power devices which read the sensors that are attached to them and then transmit their data to the SenseMetrics thread, which in turn pushes the data into the SenseMetrics cloud platform for visualization and for further analysis by the project owners. I want to point out this project, project is just one of the many where SenseMetrics and Geocon have successfully partnered to provide wireless cloud monitoring in a variety of demanding geotechnical environments. So in this site, we see a photograph of the instrumented settlement platform. The platform comprises a quarter inch thick coated steel plate measuring six foot by six foot. And you can see the earth pressure cell mounted in the upper left hand corner on the photograph. The schematic to the, to the uh, left shows uh, the integral piezometer on the GeoNet wireless node secured at the top of the pipe. Along with the uh, GeoNet node, there's a multiplexer which increases the node's capacity from a single channel device to one capable of supporting eight channels. Interesting to point out that these settlement plates were installed two weeks prior to the placement of any fill. And they were leveled by the removal of underlying soil and not by loading any high spots with fill. So, Vibrating wire sensors were chosen for this project on, on account of their excellent reliability and long-term stability. That means that any reading at any time can be referenced to the same datum. The sensors are constructed from 316 stainless steel, which offers good corrosion resistance in the saline environment. The cables have a thick pressure extruded PVC jacket and are attached to the sensors through a bulkhead waterproof seal. And each sensor contains a thermistor to allow for corrections for temperature variations and integral lightning protection in the form of a gas discharge tube. It's an important protection to have in areas subject to frequent electrical storm activity, as is the case at this project site. So for those of you who may not be so familiar with vibrating wire sensors, here's a brief expl explanation. The vibrating wire piezometer is based on a simple principle of resonance. It consists of a vibrating wire connected to a pressure sensitive diaphragm. Electromagnetic coils located nearby pluck the wire 
causing it to vibrate at its natural resonant frequency. Any change in the pressure causes a deflection of that diaphragm, which in turn alters the tension in the vibrating wire and hence its resonant frequency. Now the same coils used to pluck the vibrating wire also then also act as pickups and they transmit the tiny current produced as the wire vibrates in the coils magnetic flux back to the readout where the frequency is determined by inversing the time for one cycle of vibration. The relationship between frequency and pressure is not particularly linear, but by squaring the frequency, it's possible to, to derive a good correlation using linear regression techniques. But for improved accuracy, polynomial expressions can be, can be applied, and these can be easily accommodated in the SenseMetrics platform. The piezometer also incorporates a porous filter stone ahead of the diaphragm, which allows the water or the fluid to pass through, but prevents soil particles from, from impinging directly on the diaphragm. Now here we see the, the earth pressure cell, the one you saw in the photograph earlier. And these cells are constructed from two stainless plates that are welded together around their periphery, leaving a narrow space in between. This space is filled with a de-aired hydraulic oil, which is connected hydraulically via the connecting tube shown here between the cell and a vibrating wire pressure transducer. Any increases in the earth pressure act to squeeze the two plates together thus building up the pressure inside the fluid, which is in turn measured by the pressure transducer. And the pressure transducer performs in much the same way as the piezometer we just described, and it converts the oil pressure into an electrical signal, which is transmitted to the cable, to the readout or the logger, or in this case, the GNET node. Just wanted to point out here that the cells used in this project were standard types, which use two thin plates and they work well in clays and silts and hydrostatic um, conditions, but they're not particularly suited for use in granular soils where cells with constructed from two thick plates would perform much better. Thank you, Tony. Um, before we dive into Sensometrics technology, just want to remind the audience that if you have any questions, you can submit them digitally using the control panel at the bottom of the control panel page. So feel free to submit them and then we'll address them at the end of the presentation. So more on SenseMetrics. The platform itself consists of an integrated hardware and software pairing that delivers a true end-to-end -end solution by supporting a wide range of sensors in a single pane of glass. SenseMetrics offers a turnkey solution by delivering plug and play connectivity for sensors and devices such as vibrating wire interfaces, using our pre-configured thread edge device, which is shown uh, the three edge, uh, thread devices shown at the bottom here. The thread can serve as a gateway device, which is any device connected to the internet, and is delivered with everything you need to automate a wide range of sensors and includes technology such as a mesh networking radio and cellular modem, rechargeable lithium ion battery, surge protection, onboard storage for data outages, or I'm sorry, cell outages that is, Support for various sensors and device protocols and accept secure firmware updates using over-the-air technologies. The platform can also support other gateway devices, which furthers the user experience by being flexible. This IoT ecosystem allows for bilateral device control and subsequent data management of stored raw data, all backed by our secure cloud-based platform. In addition, our LAN analytics engine delivers Solutions that allows the user to engage with various functionality, such as the reporting module, very common tool, analysis tools, and more advanced features delivered as what we call productivity applications, all depending on the specific project needs. And then later in this presentation, we'll take a look at some of these uh, when Robert gets to that part later on. In order to deliver this seamless experience, SenseMetrics are aligned with many industry standard sensor manufacturers. This allows the owner and his engineering team to design and deliver a monitoring program that is customized to project objectives. For Kaminata Marsh, the engineer relied on different vibrating wire sensors manufactured by Geocon. This selection of sensors was based on the superior reliability and quality of the Geocon sensors and the strong technical pairing with SenseMetrics platform, a joint solution proven countless times across the global arena. 
As illustrated by this graphic and described earlier by Tony, Geocon sensors can can automate can be automated using uh, GeoNet nodes and threads, uh, which are wirelessly manage the the downstream sensors. The wireless plug and play nature between the GeoNet node and associated sensor and the thread allows the user to effortlessly automate any sensor and quickly log into sense metrics to manage map view layouts, graph views, change reading frequencies, set various alerts, and more advanced features from any internet connected device globally. On the software side of things, authorized users can build their own monitoring environment using what we refer to as core applications, which are the green icons shown on the left. These day-to-day -day tools range from GIS mapping interface to various graphing tools to document control and alerts where users can establish up to four alert levels or thresholds. Data tables allow for data import and export functionality, whereas revision management is a software feature that establishes sense metrics as a system of record, providing tools to catalog system changes and necessary modifications that are made to sensors and devices by authorized and responsible users. In addition to the core applications, SenseMetrics has developed more advanced software functionality for targeted markets that require very specific workflows and tools using our productivity applications, which are shown in blue on the right. The productivity application used by Kaminata Marsh was the report module, which provides compliance reporting on key metrics, alerts, and other features on a regularly scheduled interval. Robert will give us some examples of that as we go through this presentation. Now, we'll have Robert walk us through some of the data sets that have been generated to date, and we will uh, um, then dive into some photos of the installation. Thanks, Todd. Um, so as Todd had mentioned, the software platform is where SNME is able to remotely manage all of their data, create specific views, and share them with the rest of the project team. So everyone from the contractor to the owner can stay in the know. The map visualization tool shown here uh, allowed the project team to select the most applicable base map from 10 different Google and Esri options. The team was then able to add geo-referenced layers to the map to show project bounds and features that don't yet exist. These layers can be uploaded as DXF, GeoJSON, or shapefiles. The sensors, when added to the map, are also geo-referenced and will appear in their installed locations. The latest measurement is shown above each sensor and the icon color changes live with the sensor status. Here, the icons are blue, indicating they are currently in a low power cycle <clears throat> to conserve battery life. The low power mode means the thread and GeoNet turns on at a set schedule, typically at the top of every hour, to collect the sensor readings and report to the cloud before going back into a hibernation state. Other icon colors uh, include red, meaning the device has gone offline, in which case the user can then use the native diagnostic tools to drill into root cause, or green indicating the device is currently awake and taking readings uh, and connecting to the cloud. Using the time slider, the engineers are able to go back in time uh, to see sensor readings at any specific date. The image view module gives the team the ability to show the site from another perspective. In this example, uh, where they're using an aerial photograph. Um, you can place the sensors exactly where they're installed, um, but cross-section is similar to what we saw earlier, and other site details are also popular ways that users like to present their data. Um, as I said, the sensor icons are then manually co-located, um, similar, and they behave in a similar manner as when they're in the maps module. The graphs module gives the project team the ability to create custom profiles with an arrangement of time series graphs. The graphs can support any of the metrics the team wants to visualize alongside established threshold limits, uh, which can be shown by the horizontal lines on that bottom graph. Only raw sensor data is stored in sense metrics for the sake of data integrity. Then when a graph is generated, all the calculations are performed on the fly using the sensor configuration settings. 
And I'd like to note that when configuring your geocon sensors, like a piezometer, the calibration coefficients are automatically pulled in based on the serial number. This reduces the potential for typos and miscalculations and allows the users to set up their sensor network in a fraction of the time without needing any programming experience. This is only possible because of our close working relationship with Geocon. So using this tool, the team was able to monitor poor water pressures during fill operations and the waiting period and uh, using this live data, uh, the engineers were able to discern when the underlying soils had stabilized. This in turn allowed the contractor to begin placing fill uh, 14 days ahead of schedule. Correlations between data can also easily be brought to light using our dual axis functionality as shown here. Each axis can support any metric. So for example, during complex situations like when the slurry is being placed during a storm, you can visualize both the water elevation and the effective stress on the same plot. Using the alerts module, the project team was able to establish thresholds for the data so they would know the minute something needed their attention. Alerts can monitor any available metric from battery voltage to effective stress. And when an alert is triggered, an automatic email and push notification to the user's cell phone can be sent to every team member that needs to know. The documents module here is a central location for the project team to store and share project documents. This could include instrument manuals, field notes, or even site photos, which the user can associate with the corresponding sensor on the platform. So if an alert is triggered for a specific sensor, the user can pull up the sensor and automatically see a photo of the installation. Having all of this information at their fingertips gives the user the ability to make better and more informed decisions faster. The reports module, which is the most popular of our productivity applications, is a tool that allows the user to automate the task of generating reports, which can be very time consuming. This is especially useful when a project has deliverable requirements or needs archive, or if it's just for archival purposes. SNME is able to configure their report templates with specific graphs, alerts, and site photos, then set a schedule for the PDF to automatically generate and distribute via email to those who need it. So now let's uh, focus on uh, the installation for this project. Um, in preparation for working on the remote site, SNME wanted to ensure they fully understood how the system works and what to expect to make the deployment as easy as possible. So for this reason, SNME conducted in-house bench testing with each of the sensors and simulated events uh, in a controlled environment. So shown on the left, uh, there's a tank uh, with water and at the bottom, there is a the pressure cell and the vibrating wire piezometer in the open standpipe through the center. The tank was then filled with a slurry, uh, simulating the events they'd expect during construction. Uh, all the while, the sensors were connected to the GeoNet nodes and transmitting data live to the threads where they could uh, visualize the data live coming in um, and they could become familiar with uh, how the data was handled and um, how they would configure all of their sensors. And the right photo is showing one of the open standpipes that they're also testing. So as we mentioned before, the site required using a fan boat to access each of the locations and all installations needed to be performed from within the boat. You can see in this photo a thread on the seat uh, which shows just how small the footprint of the sensors and loggers were. And this made it particularly conducive for the project um, by reducing the number of trips needed to transport equipment from the landing to the install locations. 
Here we have a few photos of the threads and geonuts in their installed locations. Um, the thread is secured on a wooden post with an extension on the radio antenna. For this gave improved line of sight and uh, improved communications with the geonuts. Then the geonut on the right, uh, that is installed on a steel pipe or a steel rod, uh, which extends down to the drive point piezometer. The data cable comes up through the center and out the top to the geonet. Uh, and you'll see that that is also outfitted with um, an, extent, an external antenna. So just bear in mind that uh, these geonets were not only placed high enough to accommodate the future dike, but also for storm surges that would also inevitably impact the site. The instrumented settlement plates were very recently installed um, and shown in these photos. Uh, due to the large dimensions of the settlement plates, the contractor assisted with their marsh buggy to carry and drop the, the plates into place. So we've talked through the installation and tools used on the project. And so now I'd like to summarize conclusions and benefits. Some of this is through the eyes of the project team. So I'd like to try to convey that here. Throughout this project, the value of the sense metrics and geocon solution has presented itself in many ways. First, the in-house testing prior to deployment allowed SNME to fully understand how everything would connect so there would be no unknown variables once in the field. This was particularly helpful given the remote nature of the site. Using the instrumentation data during the, some preliminary field tests, the team was able to identify and remove unnecessary design elements, such as a sand base layer below the containment dike. Another benefit the instrumentation provided to the project was allowing the team to watch the data in real time after each lift was placed on the containment dike. This real-time data allowed the contractor to proceed uh, with the next lift two weeks ahead of schedule, reducing the typical waiting period. All of these benefits add up, and as SNME put it, the instrumentation pays for itself from the increased schedule efficiencies. The pairing of geonets and threads also proved to be invaluable as the wireless mesh network gave the instrumentation a small footprint. This minimized cable runs to the loggers, which were ready for the harsh environment right out of the box. No additional protective cabinets were necessary, which can be heavy and awkward to install. The onboard memory of the geonets also proved to be valuable as they were uh, able to keep collecting data throughout the storm surges, while the threads, which were installed lower down for accessibility, could be removed for the worst storms and reinstalled afterwards. afterwards. When the geonets reconnected to the thread, all the stored data would then be uploaded with no data gaps. Real-time access to the data using our browser-based platform and mobile app has enabled the project team to have full control of their data from anywhere and at any time. The mobile app in particular shows the team, um, it allows the team to configure new sensors before ever leaving installation locations, um, but it also allows uh, the user to review any alert notifications, uh, even if you're just standing in the store of uh, wine. And so with that, um, I'd like to thank everyone for your time. Um, we're now going to turn it over to Todd and Matt to address questions that have been coming in throughout the presentation. Thank you, Robert. Matt, do you have some questions that you'd like to uh, read out loud to the, to the audience and provide answers? Sure. Um, actually, I'll take the, the first one here. Um, that I probably would take direct both to Tony and uh, both of you, uh, and you can each answer in your own way. But is, how long is a system like this viable for? How long is a system like this viable for in a coastline saline environment? 
uh, not in terms of the battery life, but how long it can withstand against corrosion. But Tony, I don't know if you want to answer on regards to Geocon sensors. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Well, as we pointed out in the presentation, the sensors supplied here were were constructed from 316 stainless steel, which um, do perform well in, in saline uh, situations, offshore situations. Um, and we've had good success um, in, in the past with, with this material. That said, there are other options um, if a user is particularly concerned about um, longevity in this environment. You know, we have versions that are fabricated from Inconel and titanium, but but here it was um, 316 um, was shown to be adequate. Um, for the for the life of this project, as um, as Robert indicated, it's uh, early days yet. But um, on our, in our experience with offshore work, we've had years and years, ten years of success. But but that said, I, I do know of a couple of occasions where we supplied sensors with 316 in, in an offshore environment, and they lasted for a short time because the conditions were really really aggressive not just the um, salt water. Um, I'll let Todd speak to the electronic side for this now. Thank you, Tony. Um, so the thread device uh, comes in two different variants. Um, there's an IP67 rating and then a newer one that's IP66 rating that has um, protection for uh, fresh water and saline water. Um, we, again, being a new project, we haven't had the, the test of time yet to, to evaluate long-term um, performance, but we would expect many years of uh, performance with no um, detrimental effect to the hardware. Very good. Well, thanks for that. There, um, there are several questions here regarding, um, you know, particulars of the of the the project. Uh, I don't know if if we want to answer some of those offline, but um, you know, some of them regarding like the weight of a settlement. The settlement plates. Um, I'm not sure if we have that information handy or not. Yeah, we'll have to defer that and in, in the dike question that came in to the engineer, and we can collect that information and then provide it after this after this session. Okay. I don't know if you saw there. There is a question um, asking if there is a security camera on one of the devices. I don't know if you can answer or allude to that. Yeah. Um, this particular project did not deploy. A, well. Robert it was not deployed with Sense Metrics, although Sense Metrics does have a camera solution. Robert, do you know if SNME had their own uh, camera deployment on the job? Uh, yes. Um, the reason that they had used their uh, separate outside camera source was that at the time that the project was bid, um, we did not have our current uh, camera available at the time, but uh, since that point, we have uh, released our camera abilities so and I have a, the question here um, which maybe we can kind of allude to the importance of or or not uh, Tony it says in such offshore environment what measures were taken for temperature compensation I don't know if we can speak directly to the project but we can maybe you know discuss you know how that applies to our instruments sure sure that's a good question um, the way in which the vibrating wire sensors are constructed, that they're, we try as we might to minimize any um, thermal sensitivity, there always is some. And that's why we built into the sensor a thermistor to allow for temperature measurements. And in this way, um, by knowing any changes, we can apply a correction for, you know, from the temperature at the time of installation to the temperature at the um, current time. Um, with, in the case of pressure cells, it's a little more complicated and probably beyond the scope of what we have, can, can discuss here. Um, because in the pressure cell, there's a, there's a fluid and, and, and a transducer and, and uh, yeah, it's kind of complicated. Um, but that said, in this, in this particular environment, the temperature variations were, were very small. And, and, and given the fact that the temperature correction is, is quite small, um, I don't think it, it poses a big problem to the accuracy of the data obtained. Um, but anyway, that's that's why we measure the temperatures. And um, if anybody's particularly interested, we can get into pressure cell corrections um, 
after this after this meeting. I appreciate that. And just one more follow up to the pressure cells, just too, is just in general, um, you know, regarding any any certain steps that might be taken to ensure a good installation of a pressure cell. Oh man, that's a tough question. Um, pre pressure cells are tough. In this environment, it's quite hydrostatic and, and they perform well here. So um, um, it's not so critical, but in other uh, other installations, as I, as I indicated, in, in granular materials, um, it can be a little bit more complex. Um, the, reason, the reason being really is that the, the cells ought to be as stiff or as compressible as the as the material in which they're in, in, installed. And if they're less stiff, um, then they tend to over-register. If they're more stiff, they, they under-register. Um, you know, we, we tried to design them for, well, there are several designs and you choose the one most appropriate for the material in which you're working. But, uh, um, and yeah, a number of other factors, the compaction around the cell, um, making sure it's not, um, the backfill material is not uh, washed out. It can be quite uh, complicated. But in this, as I said, in this application, um, in this environment, they'll they work really well. Okay, very good. Matt, I have a couple questions here I'll, I'll take on. Yeah, sure, go right ahead. Um, one question we got, or just received is the sense metrics have to configure the software and sensors or do I? And that's a very relevant question. We get that quite often. Um, we built a platform for the user to use. So the platform itself is meant for you to engage, configure, um, connect to the GeoNet nodes, connect to the sensors, and, and the user themselves controls that, that workflow. Um, that includes setting up maps and graphs, setting alerts, that's all done by the end user. Um, since metrics does offer training so we can provide remote or in-person training um, to make users more proficient with the platform um, a lot of users do engage in that that um, experience but generally speaking the, the platform is built for the user to to consume and use on their own um, another question that we had was are those is there going to be additional sensors added to the existing geocon and sense metric installation or will additional hardware be needed? Um, don't know the answer to that question quite yet, but the platform that's out there now, both SenseMetrics and Geocon, um, can be added to with existing hardware. Um, in some cases, if it's a vibrating wire sensor, it's very easy to add sensors um, using wireless GeoNet nodes. Um, if there's other more power intensive or um, different technologies being deployed, um, it might be sense metrics threads that will use be used for that deployment example that might be a weather station or a um, camera or a robotic total station and such so the existing system does have the ability to expand or contract as project needs uh, change uh, if you've seen the next question that just came in about um, asking to throw some light on data security um, is the data you know routed through sense metrics that is another one hour webinar um, but I will try to uh, give you guys cliff notes uh, sense metrics has many layers of security built into it um, at the sensor level we only collect the raw sensor data and for vibrating wire sensors it's Hertz um, once that data is transmitted using uh, advanced security protocols with encryption technologies from thread to thread the data is then finally distributed to the cloud platform where it's stored in an encrypted fashion, but also in um, its raw form factor. Um, another layer of security is you have to be an authenticated user to log into the account. Once you do log in and you log into your portal in the project level, you then do what we call API calls to pull the data out of the cloud and you can visualize the data in real time. Um, but the, the actual transformation from raw metric into engineering units occurs instantly when the engineer or the user does the call to that particular sensor. We'll provide more information uh, with uh, maybe some graphics in our response when we get back to everybody. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, I think, like I said before, I think some, several of these questions are uh, ones we need to get a little more information to reply back on. Um, Todd, unless you think there are a few that you might 
able to answer, but um, uh, to my knowledge, I think we have to get more information. So far, we have a, a less than about, about a dozen questions here, and we got most of them answered. The ones that we're going to hold back on are the ones that we can't answer right now. So we ask for everyone's forgiveness in that regard. But um, we will follow up with everybody and get everyone answers um, in the next week or so. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining, and we hope everyone um, got some good information from this webinar. This is a this is a real world problem that we're facing, and sort of a new new application of old old sensor technologies that are dependable and reliable. And rolling that in with an automated monitoring solution like SenseMetrics becomes a very valuable tool uh, for the industry. So we're hoping that um, if you have some follow up questions, feel free to reach out to Tony, Matt, Robert, or myself, and we can help explore. Um, what you may be looking at. Thank you, everybody.